I just want to introduce the great Mark Wanamaker that we have here tonight um, to kick off our first in-person program since the pandemic started. I'm sure many of you know already about him, but I think he still deserves an introduction. So he's a film historian and author who's worked in film production, exhibition, and research for several decades. He grew up in LA, um, holds degrees in theater arts, music, and history. He assisted in the forming of the American Film Institute and the American Cinema Tech. He's a published historian, lecturer, and teacher who has taught film history at UCLA. And beginning in the 1970s, he, he assembled what came to be known as the Bison Archives, an extensive and unique photo archive with its name referencing an early film studio and is used for story research publishing, international media outlets, and documentary film production. And Bison Archives um, has been used in over 100 documentary films, and for his new book, Hollywood Trains and Trolleys, um, he used many photos from his collection. And I should add, also, um, some of his photos now reside at the Academy's Margaret Herrick Library. Um, so without further ado, here is the great raconteur, Mark Wanamaker. I'm appear to you as a Westerner. I don't have my cowboy hat with me right now, but basically I just freshly came from the Lone Pine Film Festival. And Lone Pine, you know, that's where the famous Alabama Hills are. So that's sort of a Hollywood away from Hollywood. We're talking about, I just made a major discovery. And that is, they thought the first film made in Lone Pine, can you all hear me okay? Okay, good. Um, they thought the first film was a, a Roscoe Arbuckle film, and uh, can't remember the name all of a sudden, but uh, we're talking about 50, 60 years, they thought this film, 1920 it was made, uh, that was it. Well, doing, uh, I named my archives after the Bison Film Company, that's the second company, I'm gonna show you a picture of it. Uh, and that came to Los Angeles in 1909. The first one was the Selig Polyscope Company. I don't want to pop too much, I'll get back. Uh, and uh, I'm going to show you that too. Because the history of railroading and trolley cars, transportation, is all intertwined with the film industry. Aviation, to trains, to cars, to whatever. It's, as you can imagine, since the very beginnings of the film industry, we're talking in the 19th century, they were already, uh, we're gonna see great stuff. Uh, and this book is covering it. Now, how did this book, oh yeah, so to finish, um, excuse me, so the Bison Film Company, I was doing my research, it turns out that it was the first company to film in Lone Pine. Can you imagine, it sent shockwaves to all the historians there. And uh, I have proof, and I found an, an article and an ad in 1909, Moving Picture World, and there it was, there's a shows the stagecoach, that's from Keeler, that's a village, a mining village nearby. And it shows a building and it says Lone Pine right on it. I mean, come on, <laughs> wow. So I mean, this is really major because uh, the Lone Pine uh, area is in the Owens Valley. And that's of course where the aqueduct, uh, part of the aqueduct comes from, and the water from the DWP come from there. Uh, it's also a very important mining town, so all up and down the Owens Valley. Right over the hill to the east is Death Valley. And uh, over the hill to the other side, which is Mount Whitney, is of course Yosemite. And to the south near Kernville is uh, our other national park. So this area, especially Mount Whitney, Ansel Adams went there and shot films, uh, I mean shot his stills. But the point is, is that people ask me, why would they go to uh, Lone Pine? Well, it was a tourist attraction in the 19th century. So when the railroads were putting, being put in there for the mining, and also Reno's right at the top, they wanted a railroad to go to Reno and Virginia City. So the Virginia City and Truckee Railway was all up and down there. So it was a common thing to go. They went everywhere. All these early companies, the Sealer Company, they went everywhere. And uh, the locations, we're gonna talk about that too. So how did this book come apart, you know, come to be? Um, the Los Angeles Heritage Railroad Foundation, which I've been loaning them pictures. They've been having uh, exhibitions at Philippe's in downtown LA for years and years. They are a group that is a consultancy group to many railroad museums all around the country. 
they have, it's not like a, an organization which they have a membership, they do have a membership, but that membership goes on live tours on, on history. I gave a tour uh, for the group on uh, Hollywood Studios. We went to all the studios. And Joe Lesser, my co-writer, who unfortunately passed away just not too long ago, he would give tours of where all the trolley uh, routes were and all the train routes. And this is, in other words, the history of railroading and trolleying in LA, Southern California, is really the development of Southern California. Without that, it might not have developed at all. You have to understand that transportation is real important. So just think about this before we move on. Just think, when you drive up to San Francisco on the five, for example, and you're going over the hills there and uh, uh, Fort Tejon, you know, and you come down the grapevine and then you go into the, to the San Joaquin Valley and, and you go to San Francisco, right? It takes, what, six, uh, seven hours, right? Just think, without the freeway, without the road, without the car. How did you get up there? You took a horse, stagecoach, if there was a route, a wagon, or walk. And it's amazing, that's not that long ago. It's just, you know, it's just 150, 200 years ago. It's not a long time when especially, I do a lot of research in Europe and other places, we're, we're talking Roman history, and this is nothing. This is new history, and how we progress so quickly and transportation is helped do this. So of course the first, uh, uh, oh yeah, so they asked me to do a book on this. So I gave them a manuscript, and the manuscript pretty much was uh, what, ra what um, railroads and, tr and um, trolley cars and uh, locomotives were in this picture and that picture. And so Joe said to me, there's, there's this guy named Jess, and he already did three little books, paperbacks, and that's all it's about. It's about which locomotive was in it. That's not what he wanted. He wanted something that people can learn from in which the intertwining of, of railroads and trolleys and film industry and the beginnings of Hollywood in Los Angeles. God, I thought, oh my gosh, this is a much harder project than I thought. So it took two years to think about how to do this and put it together, and this is the format that we came up with. So let's move on. Oh, it worked, it worked. <laughs> I'm sorry it's so small, but what can I do? You get, if you have any binoculars, uh, you can use them. But uh, anyway, what, what this is, of course, the, it just shows you at the beginning of this whole thing, is the, um, how can I put it, the publicity of using transport in films. You know, the, the trains and trolleys became stars in films, you know, as we know, and, uh, and, uh, or they used them to, uh, to move on, to use them as transportation or they use them as a background, or they use them for whatever. I mean, you're gonna be amazed when we see, going coming up, how they use trains and trolleys in films. And uh, this is Helen Holmes, uh, can you see that? That's Helen Holmes in A Railroader's Bravery. It's the same one over here, you know, on my poster. Uh, Helen Holmes and uh, many of the uh, early pioneering stunt women and action heroes of the silent era uh, make Wonder Woman look funny because they were doing stuff you wouldn't believe. Now, I've started a new uh, kind of side career now. I'm doing podcasts and videos. I've done my first one. So I all urge you to go online. It's real simple. Just History of Hollywood with Mark Wanamaker podcast. The first one is all about the beginnings of the film industry coming from New York to Los Angeles, the whole thing. I talk about Poverty Row, I talk about Gower Gulch. Yes, with sound effects of winning horses and cows, you will love it. I have a really good producer who put it, so it's very entertaining, but there's a lot of information to, that most people don't, learn, you know, don't know or learn about. So the next one is the pioneering, uh, uh, pioneering female action heroes of the silent era. That's, that's Pearl White and uh, Helen Holmes, Helen Gibson, Ruth Rowland, and, and Texas Guinan, and many others. And Cowgirls, that's another one I'm working on now. And also I did a Hollywood Aviation. And some of them are based on my books I've done for, uh, for um, uh, Images of America, you know, the Arcadia books. So, um, and then, oh yeah, I also did one on the Lincoln Motion Picture Company of, of uh, Noble Johnson, the first black company in LA, really early on. And they were in South Central, but they also had a studio in Westwood. How do you like that? So anyway, it's going to be very interesting as time progresses. So anyway, you see the kind of uh, publicity they were doing. This is the Tom Mix one. Tom Mix poster right here. Look at that. He's actually 
on a, on a rail car, which is supposed to be moving, he's jumping his horse into it with, with a girl on the back. And the Wyoming mail, of course, is all about blowing up, you know, uh, the, for the mail and uh, robbery. And Al Jennings was a famous robber. Would you believe that he went to prison and he came out of prison and he became a movie star. He had his own film company and made films about his exploits. Can you imagine? <laughs> I don't think you're allowed to do that now. And uh, um, one last thing about this. Uh, well, we're going to get into it. Okay, let's move on. Here's some more for you. That's Hood Gibson here, the local bad man. Don't you love the titles? Come on, this thing doesn't work. Oh, uh, never mind. Can't see it anyway. Uh, the, it says Carolina Cannonball, Kansas Pacific, the Harvey Girls, remember Judy Garland? And Hurricane Express, which is a serial that they did, all relating to railroading. Now, Hollywood in 1910. This is a still actually taken from where the Yamashiro is today. And um, uh, it works. That's Hollywood High School, right there. That, no, I'm sorry, that's the Hollywood Hotel. I'm sorry, that's Hollywood Eye. There we go. That's Highland Avenue right over here. Hollywood Boulevard is right here. The Chinese Theater is right there. And there's the Cinematographer's Union building right here on Orange and Franklin. So this is what the movie companies came to see. Now interestingly, this picture was taken by the Biograph Company in 1910, D.W. Griffith, and he actually filmed a film called In Old California, and he started the film out by showing what Hollywood looked like at the time. So that film exists, can you imagine? This is, you can see this alive, I mean live. It's a time machine, that's what I'm trying to say. Now let's go to the beginning of movement Movement, remember, trains, trolleys, movement, cars, movement, and the film industry. Film industry is movement, isn't it? Let's go back to 1872. Leland Stanford, governor of California, makes a bet with other uh, uh, ranchers and other these rich guys down there in, the, in uh, San Francisco that a horse, when it gallops, all of its hooves rise off the ground, okay? Others said that's impossible. There's always one leg on the ground. By the way, is it possible to turn the lights down a little? Yeah, let's try that. All right, so you see here, so there was this crazy lunatic photographer that was wandering around the Sierra Mountains. His name was Ed Weird Moybridge. Yes, his name was Ed Weird, because he was weird. And he, uh, he was famous at the time because he shot and killed his, his wife with her lover. And that was a, 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 you know, a crime of passion, thus he got off in those days. So uh, what happened is this, but he was really a good photographer, so Stanford said we can prove this with photography, right? So he, they sense, find him somewhere. His beard was like ZZ Top, I'm not joking, his hair was like this, he was like a hermit living up in the mountains. Luckily a bear didn't get at him. And uh, he brought him back down to Palo Alto, where, the, uh, where um, Stanford's ranch is. And they set up a battery of cameras, and they were shooting the horse running. He would put trip lines, and they would shoot them. Th this is the result of it, of the trip lines. But get this, it took six years, and he couldn't get it. So back to railroads again. Leland Stanford hired an electrical engineer for the uh, Northern Pacific Railway. And he put on the cameras electronic trip, you know, trip lines. So that worked. So look at the result right there. Look at that. Off. See? It proved the point. Lillian Stanford won, won the argument. Now look at these pictures. You see them. So, so uh, Moybridge got an idea. He put them on a revolving glass like disc. Right? These are birds. These happen to be birds. So what happens is he put them like a record player. He put them up and shined the light behind it. Or he put them on a zoopraxiscope, which is you know, the, uh, you know, the thing that turns and you look in it. We have them in Culver City, of course. So uh, what do you call it? Zoetrope. Yeah, zoetrope. Zoetrope, thank you. So when, when they moved it, the horses were running. We're talking 1870s, 1880s. This was mind-blowing to people. 
We had moving pictures. It started. It began. And it began by railroad people, which is kind of interesting. Hmm. I pushed the wrong button. There we go. Oh. There we go. Now, this is in 1898. Now, this is a few years later, of course. It's, see, 1872, 3, 4, 5, 6. 1878 is when they figured it out. So it's about uh, 20 years later. Uh, they actually have cameras now. Pathé, Edison's making cameras. Uh, Edi um, Eastman's making film, actual film that you put in the cameras. So they're already using cameras. And the first ones, this is Billy Bitzer. That was DW, later D.W. Griffith's cameraman on the front of the locomotive. Look at this. He mounted the camera on the front. Now the Lumiere brothers also did the same. No, no, I thought there was nice music behind what I was saying. <laughs> That's like my podcast. <laughs> so anyway, what they did was, can you, and Lumiere brothers were doing it as well. So what they do is they mounted a camera on the platform at the station. So when you see the train coming in, and you have Billy Bitzer, or people like Billy, with the camera on the front of the locomotive. So we have these kind of shots. So get this. So the audience is watching the train coming in coming straight at them. And they were ducking because it was so real. It's like IMAX. Remember when IMAX came out and we were like, wow, this is freaked out? Well, that's how they felt with motion pictures. And it was, they used railroads first. Later cars, later planes, but railroads were first. Hmm. Here we go. Now the first narrative film to use railroads was the great train robbery, Edison's 1903 masterpiece, because it was a narrative film, it was the first narrative. Edison and the others were doing like the famous kiss, in which uh, a couple kisses. Then there was another one, which is so funny, remembers um, Some Like It Hot, Marilyn Monroe, yeah. she's in New York and her dress blows up, blah, 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 right? Well, guess what? Edison already did that in, in uh, it was 1901, I think, and in which uh, a couple's walking down the street in New York City, and she walks over the uh, subway gate, you know, the subway vent, and her dress blows up. 1901. So, <laughs> so I think Billy Wilder, who knows his history, how do you like that? It's, what a sensation that is, right? Now. They started doing this. It's all on the East Coast. There's studios on the East Coast. Uh, they're in New York City itself, in New York State and in, and in uh, New Jersey. The first real big studios when they migrated off the Manhattan Island was on, at Fort Lee, New Jersey. So I'm happy to tell you that um, one of my dreams was to have uh, a museum in Fort Lee, New Jersey, and uh, my colleagues and I, we actually got our wish. We got $18 million from the city of Fort Lee, and uh, all the studios are gone, but we put beautiful stanchions there to show where the Solex studio was and where the Edison studio was and where Biograph and all these other later companies built their studios there in Fort Lee. But eventually, they were going down to Cuba and to Florida because of the weather and the East Coast, obviously. So um, nobody really came out to California yet until about 1906, 1907, when Selig Polyscope Company of Chicago came out. And uh, what they were coming out here to see is this. This is the Santa Susana Pass in Chatsworth, but this is the West, the real West. So I use this as an example. This train here is in the real West, and you, get, you have an authenticity. So then the Bison Company came out to make real Indian pictures and everything. In the real West, they were making these Indian pictures with Sioux Indians in New Jersey. And everybody knows New Jersey and Manhattan and all around. I mean, it was, they had to come West. Now, you, I know you can't see this, but basically what it is, we found a, uh, a kind of a cartoon, this, this cartoon here, and uh, it says here, uh, a, tip, um, a cartoon appearing in the Los Angeles Express in 1912 titled, No Place Like California. So it says, to the east here. Yes, I hadn't thought of that. Maybe they're going to use it for shipping the oranges east, the trains they're talking about. And then they're talking here, as I live, there's grass. Yes, don't it look good? 
Got a match, Al? Sure thing. I don't know what that's for. <laughs> but anyway. So, so in other words, this is from, uh, and then there's a postcard up there. To, uh, I have early postcards. Now, the, the, the famous play, uh, the famous book by Helen Hunt Jackson, Ramona, became a most famous 19th century uh, book about the uh, racism against Indians, American Indians. And she hated that, and she, she took it Romeo and Juliet and turned it into a young Spanish girl on a, on a, on a, um, on a, at a hacienda, on a rancho, and she met, falls in love with a young Indian boy, Mission Indian boy, which was verboten, of course. And they, they elope, they run away, and it does not end well. And that's the whole point that she wanted to make. That the, it was, this racism was ridiculous, you see what I mean? So she pushed this through. So people started to come. It was a very popular book. They started to come west on the train. We're talking the 1880s now, 1890s, 1880s, 90s. And there were postcards made of where she was inspired. So she went to Rancho Camulos. Rancho Camulos is in Ventura. It's, it's right near Magic Mountain. You should visit it sometime. And, they, and the whole thing, the whole idea was that's the rancho where Ramona was born and all this kind of thing. So guess what, the Biograph Company in 1910, remember that shot I showed you of Hollywood? They came out, they decided to do Ramona. Mary Pickford was the first Ramona. And where did they shoot it? At Rancho Camulos. So we have this real history and film history already starting to intertwine, using transportation and all this all mixed up. I mean, I never thought any about this all these years until they asked me to do this book. And I'm starting to think about it, and you'll see what I mean. Next, Hollywood, 1896. The time of Ramona, the stories, and all this. Of course, all the missions were visited. Now, the Selig Company, when they first came out, by train, by the way, everybody comes by train. And they came out here in 1906, but they decided to come back and really make a go of it in 1908. And they filmed on the top of a building in downtown LA. And then that wasn't good. You know, skylights are up there and things. So they went down to a Chinese laundry called the Zing, the, the, the Sing Z Laundry, Sing Key Laundry, excuse me. I looked it up downtown. And um, they shot on the drying yard down there. I had actual pictures of that in 1908. And uh, that was the beginning. So you have to understand that, that these companies coming out were making these films, tourism. Tourists see these films, and they're starting to come out, not just for Ramona, but for the El Camino Real. The El Camino Real was the famous road, that, um, that's the Mission Road, of course. You know, the bells that we see, the, the Real bells. So these were for tourists to come and see old California, real California, re the real West. Look at this. I mean, if this isn't publicity, I don't know what is. I mean, <laughs> this is in 1912. Um, actually, 1915, but in 1912, you have to understand Universal was formed because of these small independent companies who were fighting the, the trust. The trust was um, an Edison uh, joined together with other large companies at the time because they owned the cameras, they owned the patents, excuse me, on the cameras, the film, etc. So a little independent would have to buy a license from Edison to get a camera or get buy some film. So many of them said, no way. We're not going to do that. We're going to make our own films. And a war started. It wasn't a war war, but they were shooting. And there was uh, goon squads beating each other up and stuff. That did happen. And basically, Universal was formed basically as a distributing company for these independents. And they got their lawyers together. Everybody got their lawyers to fight the Edison Trust. And they did win after several years. So they, they came out in 1912 first to um, take over some of the independents at Gower and Sunset in Hollywood, and uh, where the Nestor Film Company, that's the first studio in Hollywood, and they took that over, and everything seemed to be fine for a while, and then what happens is the, the company decides to break apart. Some independents moved on, others moved this way, and that way, and this way. So they, they at this time, they rented a, the famous Providencia Rancho, that is, of course, where Forest Lawn is today. And that's where the first Universal was for two years. They were there from 1912 to 1914. The problem is they wanted it. It was called the Oak Crest Ranch. They wanted it. And the owners, which were several ranches there, did not want to sell. 
So what happened is they decided to move on. They moved to the west to another big ranch they could buy. That's where Universal is today on Lancashire Boulevard. So, for the, so they already had three openings. They had a 1912 opening. Then in 1913, they decided to form, quote, Universal City. And the first mayor of Universal City was Lois Weber, famous uh, director. Mm -hmm. And the first police chief there was Laura Oakley. She was an opera singer. She was 6'4". Oh, wow. And she, she was in charge of the horse patrol to patrol the uh, Los Angeles River that was full of uh, uh, bodies and uh, people using it, uh, encampments. God, it sounds familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> so anyway, the point is, is that um, finally when they bought the new property, this time they did a real opening. And they came by train, they came by many trains, and they put giant banners on them. We are on our way to Universal City, California, where universal moving, moving pictures are made. Right? Hmm. Now, downtown, in 1910 to 1911, D.W. Griffith with the Biograph Company had come, as I showed you that picture of Hollywood. And that is D.W. Griffith in the bowler hat in the middle. You think these things would work. Oh, there we go. And see the open studio here? They had uh, diffusers over the stage here. That's the diffuser. Come on, work. There. And there's the open stage, and they're making the films in there. They didn't need a lot of lighting. There was lighting available, but they didn't need it. The light came through this diffuser, which was muslin usually, and brightened the whole stage up, so you didn't need lighting particularly. So get this. Guess where he went to set this studio up in 1910? In the car barn parking lot for the Pacific Electric in downtown LA at Pico and Georgia Street. So not only are they using these uh, conveyances, they're using their actual car barns. They're using them as stars, like you saw, and using for publicity as early as 1910 to 1912. I mean, this is a long time ago, if you think about it. Good, now, this is Joe Rock. Joe Rock here in the middle, pointing. He's directing at this time. And that's uh, Earl Montgomery right here, the comedian. And they're down here. It says, Vitagraph Company using trolley cars in downtown Los Angeles, 1916. So Joe Rock, I knew Joe Rock. He was great. He was a Poverty Row producer. He started at the Vitagraph Company in Brooklyn, New York in 1909 as a comedian with, with, um, with Earl Montgomery. And uh, he was a gymnast. He was in the circus. He was everything. And he was a terrific guy. I miss him. He died like 105. Good, Joe. He won, he won an Academy Award for a documentary he did called um, The Destruction of Krakatoa Island. Krakatoa was an island in the Mediterranean that blew up. It was a, a famous uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, explosion of the whole island just disappeared. He made a documentary flying around it, won an Academy Award. But this is him as a director in the early days on location in LA using Pacific Electric cars. And that is... Um, this one is, uh, oh, I forgot. I, it's, uh, I think it's Ruth Rowland. Pretty sure it's Ruth Rowland. There's Helen Gibson, Ruth Rowland, Helen Holmes, uh, Pearl White, Florence Lawrence, um, Texas Guinan, and others, others, others of these women who were co race car drivers, cowgirls. They uh, were uh, jumping on and off of trains, uh, flying airplanes. Um, they were spies, they were like James Bond types, but female version of this. All this was going on in these early teens. And now we think Wonder Woman now and Batgirl and all this stuff. Let me tell you, I've seen some of these films. They didn't have the special effects. They didn't have the certain stunts that you couldn't do, you'd break your neck. They did the stunts themselves. I mean, they are my heroes, right? I love them. Sure, there were the men that did it too, but the women, I like the women better. They're more interesting <laughs> than the men were. And look what she's doing. Do you notice there's nothing attached to her? Hold on, let me go back. Look at that. There's no guideline holding her. And look at all the guys that with all the cameras. There's, they don't have any belts on. There's no, there's nothing. So the train is moving slowly. But the train can't stop quickly because they'll all fall off. <laughs> but this, and then you know, she's going to end up jumping off. 
Now they had nets, they had this and that, but Helen Holmes and Helen Gibson, like for example, they go over an overpass and there's like a rope. They grab the rope and the train goes and they're hanging there, right? And it's like 20 feet down. Yes, later on they had a net there to drop. But come on, that's still pretty dangerous. I love Ruth Rowland, she was terrific. Now this is in 1900, and this is actually a still, as you can see, but it's actually film footage of the Edison Company when they came here in, in 1898 and 1900 to shoot Spring Street. That's Spring Street, downtown LA. Now look at what we see on Spring Street. We have trolley cars. What is a trolley car and what is a street car, you ask? A trolley car is a, that thing that sticks up with a little trolley, they call it a little trolley, which runs on an electric cable above. That gives the power to the electric motor in the trolley car. A street car runs with a cable underneath. It's like a cable car, it's the same kind of thing. And that would run underneath. So that's the two different types. So uh, sometimes they couldn't have overhanging, they would have to use it in the ground. But look at, that, look at the bustling downtown LA on the street. We have, of course, the street cars, uh, trolley cars, and we have uh, wagons. Do you, I don't see any cars, do you? Yes, there's one right there. That is a car. It looks like uh, a carriage. It's called a horseless carriage. <laughs> yeah, that's not that long ago. All right. So now we have here the first Los Angeles Depot in 1900, Alameda and Commercial Street. Now, it says here in chapter two, just what the movies needed, it has to move. So, in other words, the filmmakers who are here now at the, in the turn of the century were using anything that moved. It was horses, cars, trolley cars, railroads, whatever, even a dog. <laughs> they started to use, I, I use this as an example, this is the Pasadena Santa Fe Station 1950 for the universal production of Peggy. And that's Charles Coburn right there the, on the bottom right. But the point is they started using the stations that already existed in LA. They started using the, and you're go, I'm gonna show you some of the really early stations. Before I get to that. <laughs> Everyone silence. Please, please. <laughs> no, no, it's all right, it's all right. I mean, my, 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 uh, my cousin's an actress, you know, in London. And I remember uh, it was a serious scene from Shakespeare or something, and somebody's phone went off. And, she's, and you're not supposed to do this, but she stopped the thing, and, and they, they escorted the person out, and they're super humiliated, and she went on with the play. <laughs> I can't blame her, though. I mean. But normally she wouldn't have done that. All right. Now, how do we find the, all these places? Well, all the studios as far back, would you believe is Edison's day, 1906, 1907, they had special guys that were called location managers. They would, at first, they didn't work for the studio. They worked for you know, uh, independent people. They were travel agents and whatever. That's how the Bison Company made it up to Lone Pine. They probably went to a travel agent and said Mount Whitney and the Lone Pine and all this, perfect for you. You can take the train, get there, there's a hotel there, everything was perfect. That's what they did here. So here's one of the location managers. This one happens to be at Fox Movie Tone. Uh, this one here was at um, Paramount, 1940. And you can see what he's looking at. He's looking at photographs. Now what happens is they sent all these guys out, I swear, throughout the whole country. But we'll talk about California and Southern California. They sent them everywhere. They shot every hamlet, every little town, city, even empty fields, rocks, mountains, um, just every subject you can imagine for a background. They brought back the photos to the studio, and in later years, in the 20s and 30s, they started to make up these albums. And they had whole departments with six, seven, eight people working in them. They, had, they were responsible for the weather and this and that. Now, how they, they were gonna, you'll see how they're going to procure trains, and I'll explain that in a minute. Now, this is, I put this in here because this is Santa Susana Tunnel, uh, the Southern Pacific Line through Chatsworth and Simi Valley, used by Universal's Abbott and Costello. Well, the point is they would go and shoot trestles, uh, tunnels, everything relating to railroads, 
and they went to all the railroad yards and shot the, uh, the, the locomotives and the cars and everything, and I'll explain why later. This one is uh, Southern Pacific Northridge San Fernando Valley Station used by Paramount in 1927 for Tell It to Sweeney, starring George Bancroft and Chester Conklin. So these are the old stations that were built in the late 19th century, early 20th century, and they, they were all built on the same blueprint, by the way. <laughs> so you'll find this same exact station style all over the state. So if the sign isn't on it, and I look at lots of location pictures, the sign isn't there, it's almost impossible, unless I see something around it, to know which station it could be. But you know, Arcadia Station, I'm just thinking, I'm gonna show you a picture of it, most beautiful Swiss-looking station, you know it's Arcadia right away. Now this is uh, Harold Lloyd filming scenes for Paramount's movie Crazy in 1932. He's on location at the Los Angeles Santa Fe Le Grand, railroad station in downtown. Le Grand was designed like a Turkish uh, Middle Eastern temple. Incredible place. This is the old Pasadena station. It was an old brick station. And here they are, uh, Columbia's Music Goes Round, 1936. By the way, the station was built in 1886. Okay. Now you understand why I'm so excited about this, because my specialty is locations, real history, right, film history. So um, I worked in all the research libraries at the studios for 20 years. I worked at every single one throughout the 80s and part of the 90s, and a little in the 70s, when I was five, of course. <laughs> and uh, they were getting rid of their departments or throwing away stuff they didn't need. My boss has said, you love the history of LA and whatever, take what you need. That is the basis of Bison Archives. That's how it all started. And uh, naming it after the Bison Film Company, of course, my favorite company. But in there were everything you can imagine. Houses on Adams Boulevard, little ones, big ones, the big mansions, uh, uh, the Bradbury Building, interiors. I mean, the jail, the original Los Angeles uh, jail downtown. Uh, it had, you drive, in the 19th century, you would drive your wagon, your, your paddy wagon with your horse, down below into the jail area where they had a stable down there. I have pictures of this. This Archeo Research Library had it. So when it comes to railroading and all, I have all this down. That's how this book came about. That was Harry Langdon, by the way. Now, when the, uh, 1939, when the Union Passenger Station opened, um, you have to understand that they, they cleared away the old Chinatown and they opened up a new Chinatown a little further north but I have pictures, thanks to the research libraries, of the old Chinatown, how it looked. It's back to the 19th century. So I have all these old buildings there that were sitting there, which were all cleared away, and the Bunker Hill as well. So we have all these incredible shots of Bunker Hill, and of course, Court Flight and Angel's Flight. So I have stuff on this. They took them in the 30s, 40s, 50s pictures. Yes, I consulted on the restoration of all this. So Bison Archives, myself, this little thing that turned into something massive in which because I had all these diverse kinds of pictures and history relating to films and real history, you can imagine I worked on hundreds of books and films and, uh, and city projects and, uh, arch and archeological projects and academic projects and I worked with architects and I mean, it's layered like this, it's mind blowing. And people call me all the time to get a job at Bison Archives. There must be 20 people working there. Yeah. Well, 20 <laughs> ghosts working there. <laughs> now, back to Hollywood now. So now we're going to talk about the studio. So I'm telling you now, I've just given you a little bit. This is Hollywood. This is at uh, Prospect uh, Avenue, which is Hollywood Boulevard. And Wilcox in 1909. And that's the Santa Monica line going right down Hollywood Boulevard. And then it goes up down to Gardner, and then it goes diagonally straight down all the way to, uh, let's see, went to uh, it bypass Sunset, Santa Monica Boulevard. And Santa Monica Boulevard, straight to Santa Monica. It was a quick ride. Can you imagine how beautiful it was? And there was no traffic. There's just pepper trees everywhere the whole way to Santa Monica. And what a picturesque trip that must have been. So now we have here, that I was just telling you about, this is the Selig Company, the first studio in Los Angeles. That's the drying yard I was telling you about behind the Chinese laundry. I did have a picture in here. 
And that is the uh, mascot, the little dog. That's the mascot dog. But this, as you can see, look, they put a bedroom set on a platform with a backing outside. So if the wind blows, it's going to blow everything in the bedroom. But you know what? People didn't care. This is 1909. I mean, this is moving pictures. Who cares if there's a wind blowing in the bedroom? <laughs> <laughs> now this is, remember I showed you D.W. Griffith down at the car barns, right? This is a little later. This is about uh, 1914, about four, four years later only. And look at this. They've, other companies have come here. They've already built little stages. You see them, and, and they have these muslin diffusers over them. And you can see the billboard says Charles Ray. Well, Thomas Ince, one of our greatest pioneers of the film industry, um, before, when he left the Sony studio, I'll call it that, <laughs> when he left there in 1917, he decided, Harry Culver gave him the opportunity to build his own studio again, another one, a quarter mile to the east, which is today the Culver studio. And, uh, but in between, it had to be built. So he had to make films in between. So where did he go? Right here, he was downtown at Pico and Georgia Street. That's right, you know, where the convention center is today. That's where he was until his studio was ready in Culver City. He left here, he vacated this and moved in. So you see how Culver City is all related in some way, because Culver City really was a, a transit for all these uh, trains and trolleys, of course, as we all know this, thanks to Julie's books. <laughs> That's Helen Holmes. Look what she's doing. She's hanging uh -huh. up here. There she is. So it says, Caleb Signal star Helen Holmes stunt serials on location in Mount Washington District of North Los Angeles in 1914. Uh, below is Helen Holmes at the Signal Studio at Pasadena Avenue in North Los Angeles. Now, the, the, the Calum Company formed a separate company only to make railroad thrill pictures starring Helen Holmes and Helen Gibson. Now, the reason that they both were in there because uh, Helen, uh, see, was Helen Holmes went to another company with her husband and they brought in Helen Gibson, who was Hoot Gibson's wife, who was a cowgirl, a real one, and she was doing the same stunts, jumping off of uh, trains and all. But this is incredible. She's holding on to this and the train is going by, or she's going to jump now. Oh, no, she's going to jump down. And this kid is there, whatever, to you know, spot her to make sure she doesn't <laughs> fall off the train. Now, this is the Bison Film Company in 1909. And uh, they were the second company to come here. This is a picture of their first anniversary in 1910 at their Edendale studio. That's Glendale Boulevard, where the two, the Glendale Freeway comes in and feeds into Glendale Boulevard. So you know the public uh, storage and Jack in the Box are there? That's the Bison Studio. So in here, they came from New York, and it was Princess Red Wing we're on the left right here. And we have James Young there here. And this is Charles Bauman, the head of the New York Motion Picture Company, who owned the Bison brand. And also, the reason they left here, they were here from 1909 to 1912, three years, and they had moved to, to the beach, which is today where Gladstones for Fish is, Pacific Coast Highway and Sunset, that was the in studio, in spill we call it. The Bison brand was uh, given over to the Universal, because they were all involved with the Universal Studios, and uh, so Bison moved to, to Universal, but let me explain this. So this is Fred Belchauffer here, and he's the one that devised the first, quote, B-Westerns. I just came from Lone Pine explaining how the B-Westerns got started and about the B-Westerns having that star, you know, wearing the most beautiful costume and he riding a beautiful horse, a white horse. Well, it's all related to Pegasus and the god Bellerophon, who comes and slays the dragon on the white Pegasus horse. It's the same thing. It's just cowboys doing it. <laughs> and uh, so he bought, when he first came here, he bought a beautiful white horse. That's Fred Balshaffer. He bought a beautiful white horse called Snowball. The idea was, is that Snowball, with the star, is riding it, rides into the dirty, dusty, ugly western town. And everybody's drably dressed, as you know, with their dirty hats and everything. And here's the god that rides into the town. It is so funny when you look at it this way. <laughs> so what did they do? They were using, of course, 
Edendale, that's where the studio was, Glendale Boulevard, well that was a major thoroughfare for the Pacific Electric. That went from downtown LA into Glendale and Pasadena, and also into Sunset Boulevard and into Hollywood. So they were right on the junction. So they could use it, uh, people lived in downtown, they took the trolley, it took 10 minutes to get to the studio. This was the most wonderful system that Henry Huntington and his cohorts devised. We had the greatest system, the Pacific Electric, and the yellow cars and red cars, etc. It's such a shame they're gone, but this is the studio they built, right here at the bottom, and look what it looks like. It looks like the San Gabriel Mission, because it is a copy of the San Gabriel Mission. Why? Because um, Hobart Bosworth, who was a famous stage star, which I am the biographer of, uh, he was on the stage from 1885 to 1909, joined the Selig Polyscope Company in 1909, and uh, they started to, um, uh, Colonel Selig made a deal with Bosworth, with Charles Lummis. Now you have to know who Charles Lummis was. He was our first city's librarian, he was a historian. He, he built his own house, um, I forgot the name, Los Arial or something? Los Arial. Los thank you. Which was Adobe in, in Highland Park. And, and it's, a rock, yeah, he built out of rocks, excuse me. <laughs> he took it from the, you know, the uh, Royo is there, plenty of rocks. So the point is, he loved the history of California, the ranchos and everything. They made the first deal in which a, a film company would pay a fee to use a rancho property or mission property, and that fee would go to help to uh, restore the missions. So I'm proud to say the film industry was first to help restoring California's history again. And what did they do? They made films about California history. So Bosworth played Dons, he played Vaqueros, he played Padres, and where did they shoot them? San Gabriel Mission, San Fernando Mission, San Capistrano Mission, and, and a few other missions. So people started to see this in the films. Oh, tourism started to come again, like Helen Hunt Jackson was bringing them for Ramona. You see how the film industry helped all of this, and the growth of LA, and how did it all happen? They all came by train. What else did you know? That is the uh, Keystone Studio, which is where the Bison Studio used to be. So remember Mr. Bauman I just showed you? He owned also the Keystone Film Company. He owned Bison, Keystone, KB Films, Bronco Films, and several other brands. So Keystone was brought from New York and, and was brought here. The Bison Company, as I just told you, moved to Innsville at the beach, and this became the famous Keystone Studio here in Edendale, where, of course, what I wrote here, uh, let's see, Pacific Electric Lines, da-da-da. Below 1913 is the Ma Max Senate Keystone Studio on Glendale Boulevard. That's where Charlie Chaplin was born, Roscoe Arbuckle, and, um, and Mabel Normand, and many, many others. Now, D.W. Griffith. D.W. Griffith, remember he was downtown with the biograph. Fine, he kept coming and coming from New York and he decided to stay. He, there were other companies were formed, Majestic, Reliance, Fine Arts, all these different brands and companies were, were developed. And one of the places he went to form his company, the Fine Arts Company, was at the corner today of Virgil and Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard and s where they all meet together. There's a market on the, cor on the site of this studio right here. And right here across the street where the Vista Theater is right there are the sets for his famous Intolerance film of 1916. But look at that, see the trolleys? This is a major intersection here, they go downtown. So all these studios are being built near trolley lines when they can. It just made sense. And that is the famous set, stood 150 feet high where the Vista Theater is, if you know where that is, again, Sunset Avenue, you know where KCET used to be, right next to it, and Hollywood Boulevard, Hillhurst, and um, Virgil, that whole intersection. How do you like that? Those are real people up here, by the way, not midgets. <laughs> so, yes, it was me and my friend Eugene that came up with the drawings, not the idea, but the drawings for the Hollywood Highland Project. So we gave, uh, there were four different designs. I wanted a Hollywood hotel look, you know, mission style. They didn't want that. Then there, there were some other horrible designs. It still turned out pretty horrible, but anyway. <laughs> but uh, at least, at least, at least they were gonna do this. This is the first major epic set ever built in Los Angeles. It stood for uh, six years. 
and it was a major tourist attraction, and that's why you see the elephants there at Hollywood and Highland. Now I hear they might remove all of that. So anyway, yeah, don't tell me. <laughs> now, on the major lines, this is Western Avenue and Sunset Boulevard in 1915. And this is the Fox Studio, the William Fox Studio right here on both sides of the street. Uh, today, this is, what is this now? This is uh, the new Target, isn't it? Is it Target? Yeah. Right. The lot? What, what? Is that the lot? No, 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 this is Western Avenue. Oh, Western. Yeah, this is Fox <coughs> Western Avenue. And they were on both sides, look at all this. But look at the city in the, at this time. Little houses, the little bungalows, and all being serviced by red cars. First studio in Hollywood, the Nestor Film Company, Gower and Sunset, where Columbia Square is today. Which, by the way, I have to plug Hollywood Heritage Help Save. Thank you very much. And uh, later, the Christie Studio. And this is Sunset and Gower. This is the north uh, west corner. This is how it looked later. And that then became Columbia Square, as you know it. And this is the aerial showing the whole area. Now this is Gower and Sunset, it's Sunset here, excuse me, Gower Street. There's the Christie Nestor Studio. This used to be Century Studio here, it's now Gower Galt Shopping Center. You know it? This has later become Columbia. All of this was Columbia Studios. That's the telephone building, by the way, the tallest building in the area until recently. And this is where Lulaski, famous players Lasky, Paramount Studio used to be. This shot was taken in 1926 when they were moving the whole studio to where Paramount is today. And of course, I represent Hollywood Heritage and the Hollywood Heritage Museum. Plug, plug, plug. You must visit sometime. We're open th uh, Friday, Saturday, Sundays now. And it's an insider exhibits on the history of the place Hollywood and the film industry Hollywood. And that's where Cecil B. DeMille came in 1913 to film his first feature film, The Squaw Man. And he filmed it in the valley and how did they get out to the valley? They filmed it in Sunland, and they filmed it, uh, yeah, pretty much in Sunland, many of the scenes. They filmed in, uh, of course, the mountains, the San Joaquinto, San Joaquinto Mountains. They filmed in San Pedro, and they filmed on Adams Boulevard. But the main sets, and every, on Universal Studios back lot, but they also filmed in the Sunland. So how did they get there? This is 1913. So when they got to this old horse barn at the corner of Selma and Vine Street, right, they formed their, they, there was already a studio there in a the laboratory. So there were already trolley cars on Prospect Avenue, as you saw in the picture, running back and forth. They put their equipment and people on one of them. They traveled over to Coenga Pass because in 1913, the first trolley car was put through the Coenga Pass to the Chatswood State, and excuse me, to the uh, North Hollywood Station at, at um, Come on, what's the street at the, oh, uh, the where the buses are on now? Um, Chandler. 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 Chandler, thank you. So get this, all they had to do was hop that, take the little uh, you know, a trolley car across to that station. That was a dual station. That was a, a train station for railroads and for trolley cars. Then they took the train, they transferred their equipment to the train and took it up to Roscoe. What is Roscoe? That's Sun Sunland. No, Sun Valley, excuse me. Sunland's way up. Sun Valley, that was Roscoe. And that's where they filmed the Squaw Man right there. Douglas Fairbanks also did that in 1920 when he did um, <coughs> Zorro, the, mar the Mark of Zorro. So here we have Hollywood. You see that it's getting built up. The studios are, these are all Poverty Row studios. So you, you can see that the transportation, the studios are all growing and growing in Los Angeles. This is across the street. This was the uh, Century LKO studio, Gower and Sunset, looking east. This is where Baby Peggy was. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll get a drink. Baby Peggy was one of the greatest stars. She was only like started when she was three and ended when she was like seven. But she was really, really important. And she was a friend of Hollywood Heritage and all of us. Many of us knew her. And uh, she just died recently, she was over 100. But uh, that's where she worked, and uh, this shows you the old stages, the outdoor stages, and look at the, the fake you know, New York streets and all this. I mean, this is the beginnings of Hollywood, the film industry. 
This is the beginning of Columbia. Again, Gower and Sunset. And there are the Gower Gulch cowboys standing out there. Gower gulching means is when another cowboy uh, dry gulches someone. In other words, shoots them in the back or catches them by surprise. So guess what? Two cowboys actually shot it out at Gower and Sunset one day in 1937. Thus, Gower Gulch. <laughs> the Squaw Man cast, there they are on their truck. There's the barn at Selma and Vine Street, 1913. And there they are. There's Princess Red Wing. Remember, she was with Bison. And that's Dustin Farnham, who was the star. And basically, this is the first Western feature film made in Hollywood. Thank you. That helps. And yes, they put them on the trolley car, but for their bigger equipment, they had to use a truck. And they rented a truck, and they used that to get out to Sun Valley. Now, this is, now, as the city is growing, all these studios are now becoming more modernized. This is RKO Studio and Paramount together in 1938. And basically, you have to understand that the buses were starting to be put in as well into the city. And we had many buses. We had double-decker buses. Would you believe that on Wilshire Boulevard? Isn't that great? Like in England. And open on the top. It was like they have now, the tour buses. They had them back in the 30s and 40s. But anyway, this is RKO Studio. This is the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. That was the oldest cemetery in the area. It was opened in 1899. People don't realize how old that is. And uh, this was open land. This was all o owned by the, the uh, Hollywood Cemetery Association. And little by little, the early studios started to buy from the Cemetery Association. So that's why it's, it's, it's backed up right here, you know, to the wall. And yes, the ghosts do come into the studio, and believe it or not, they go into the prop department many years ago and move the props around. <laughs> I got that from a, a guy that saw it. So. Now Universal, remember we go back to them. This is where they moved to. This is the new studio. This is looking east. This is Barham Pass right there. Those are the Hollywood Hills right there. Yes, the Hollywood sign is right on the other side there somewhere. But look at the back lot. It, this was the, the real west. Look at this. Isn't that incredible? That's their western towns, and that's their main lot. But the front lot is right beyond, be in front of me, which we'll, we'll see. Now, this is the first Universal Studios tour, and that was in 1916. And the star on the stage is Harry Carey. <laughs> and there he is, the Harry Carey unit. There's all the people up there watching the filming. They're up, up above on the gallery. There's the cameraman, and they're doing a Western scene. Because remember, Fred Balshaver started this whole thing going. What is a Western be Western? What is it all about? It's about bank robbery, uh, rivalry over a woman, uh, cattle rustling, uh, train robbing, uh, um, uh, fighting, Indians. I mean, it's all this action going on. So the funny thing is, uh, people ask uh, Gabby Hayes, the famous uh, sidekick of everybody, how come you do these? I mean, it's so boring. He says, yeah, I agree. It's the same story. It's the same. It's boring as hell, but they had music in it. They had that star riding Pegasus in. They had all kinds of funny characters and, and all this in it. So it made it fun for people to watch. Without any of that, boring. <laughs> yeah. Now, here we have Universal as it's grown. This is here in 1932. We're looking east. Here's Lancashire right in the front. And there's the studio with sound stages. Look, at, there's a big hill there separating the back lot. And there's the Los Angeles River. Look at this. And no, it was not in cement at the time. And it overflowed all the time. And it really screwed up things. I had pictures of it flooding the back lot sets. And by 1951, I believe, because I have pictures of it just after it was completed, in which they, they put it in concrete. It was causing havoc. It was knocking bridges down all around Ventura Boulevard. I mean, it was a serious river once. Now, into West Hollywood, we have La Brea Avenue and Santa Monica Boulevard. Now, Santa Monica Boulevard is a major railway and Pacific Electric way route. This is also Route 66. It's all three. And it's very important that the Pickford Fairbanks studio, which this is, was uh, built there in, well, it was another little studio there before, but Pickford and Fairbanks bought it in 1922, and that's where he, he filmed. These sets are for Robin Hood of 1922. 
These stood about 110 feet high. Well, this is seriously, you know, serious filmmaking. But look at the, the empty area here. Now, this studio here became the United Artists Goldwyn Studio, called The Lot today. Okay? Now get this. For many years, I, used to, I worked at all the studios, one thing or another. And they were complaining at this studio, there was uh, all kinds of water that was uh, coming up in the basements. And, uh, and they didn't know what it was. And they had plumbers there, and they, uh, they couldn't figure it out. Well, you know what it is? It's a creek running right under the studio here. You can see it meandering around. It was still under there when they built the studio. They had no idea it was there. Anyway, this is the Wild West. Now this is West Hollywood. This is the Sherman Yards. These are the famous uh, junction of the uh, Pacific Electric and the railroad. And today it's the uh, West Hollywood Sheriff's Station and the Pacific Design Center. Okay, now you know where it is on San Vicente. And uh, you can see all of them parked here, and this was a major thoroughfare. Well, of course, they used it for filming all the time, for many years. Sherman, California, as West Hollywood, as it was called, was a railroad town. And Barney's Beanery, as we all know it, was a truck stop, and a, uh, it was for railroaders and all that, because the whole town was a railroad town. Now, let's go further uh, uh, west, and we get to Westwood and Beverly Hills. This is Santa Monica Boulevard. Remember the trolleys? I told you how they come down from Hollywood Boulevard down to the uh, diagonal uh, way going through Gardner, right down to Santa Monica Boulevard and straight to the beach. And it goes straight past studios. When Westwood was developed in 1923 at first, William Wolf Skill was the rancho owner at the time of the property. And, um, um, and uh, this property was eventually uh, developed into a, the largest, one of the largest developments in the history of Los Angeles, the Westwood development. Yes, I'm plugging it. I did a book on it. <laughs> Arcadia, check it out, called Westwood. <clears throat> but basically, people don't realize these are the borders of Westwood. Are you ready? Sunset Boulevard and a little bit above it, like Holmby Hills. Then we have the border to the east is Beverly Hills, which is Beverly High, which is right there. That's Beverly High. All the way to Pico, right here. All the way to Sepulveda. And Sepulveda right back up to Sunset. That is a big area. So how it was developed, it was developed into small houses, medium-sized houses, commercial district, and then of course, the university district, the Holmby district, the university residential district, and the teacher's district. So they had all these different, I have it mapped out in my book exactly how it was developed and, and who was going to be there. And all of this was fed by the railroad and by the trolley cars that went right past Westwood. Oh yeah, I forgot to mention that that was Fox Studio. They bought the first, uh, they bought the first plot. This is the plot they bought. Look at this. All, all of this. Well, you see the, come on. See the square here? All of this. This became the Los Angeles, the Westwood um, Municipal Golf Course. Yes, see the oil? All the oil fields there and the back lot too. It was all in one. Okay, now we go on. Now Culver City was a major junction as well, as you, as you know. Now the trains were going down Santa Monica Boulevard, they were also going down Culver Boulevard. And, uh, and this was um, on the way to the ocean, of course. So Harry Culver was very smart to uh, build, of course, on a uh, transit zone area. And that's MGM, as you can see, 1951. We're looking west. This is, of course, Culver right here. Washington Boulevard here on the right. There's the famous colonnade entranceway to, you, to the studio and the Thalberg building. And uh, there's lot number uh, two right here. And uh, you can see that when they made their railroad pictures, they made them at the lot number three, you know, on Jefferson, which, you know, um, Meet Me in St. Louis and uh, Her the Harvey Girls, blah, blah, blah. But they also had the train station on lot one, the main lot. It was right there. And you can see it barely here. This will work. There we go. So you see the train would come here, the track, and there is a, you can see right there where it turns in, it's a spur. 
They had a spur that went right into the MGM railroad station. So when they packaged up, like they go on location, you know, they, they do it by train, just like the circus did it. And by the way, down on Culver Boulevard was the Ringling, I think it was Ringling, right? Yeah. Ringling Brothers Circus uh, Winter Quarters was there. They used the trains. So it's amazing how important the trains, Hollywood, the film industry, and entertainment industry use them all. It's fun to know. Oh. Now look at that, don't you love this? The Hell Road Studio Ranch in 1927 was located off Robertson Boulevard in the Beverly Wood District, north of the Hell Road Culver City Studio. Rhodes stored his horses and ranch sets at this location. The R Gang series was filmed at the ranch. <clears throat> also, Roach had a special effect shop <coughs> here where they built props such as R Gang locomotive, which they're standing on now. <laughs> remember in all the R Gangs, remember those great things they built for them? Those cars and trucks and fire engines, and here they have it, their own locomotive. Because you have to understand that even as far back as 1890s, remember when those people were watching the trains coming into the station? Trains were a fascination to people since they were invented. And to this day, and I cannot tell you, <coughs> I don't know what's happening to me. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Dry. Uh, it'll go away in a minute. <laughs> yeah, it'll take some more. Yes. That's it. Twentieth Century Fox and Fox. So, they were in two places. That's what I'm yeah. we, I showed you the Western Avenue lot. They, in 1923, they purchased this ranch. At first, they put the Buck Jones uh, Westerns there and Tom Mix. <coughs> and then they decided, when sound was coming, to build, to build a purposeful sound studio there called Fox Movie Tone. Uh, uh -huh. And eventually moved all operations from Western Avenue there but it, up until 1971, it was television productions there. Then they demolished it. So back to Culver City, we have, of course, the DeMille studio, which was the in studio. And then, as you know, the history of it, many things are leading up to the Culver Studios today. And of course, right built right on Culver Boulevard. Oops. Uh, that's Ince Boulevard and Culver Boulevard. Named after Ince, of course. <laughs> Here's, here it is when it was the Archaeopathe Studios. Now this building has been saved, as you know. Now in my other lecture that many of you heard of the Hollywood's Lost Back Lot book, which is right out there, by the way, uh, we detail uh, uh, that uh, thanks to uh, many um, LA Conservancy and the Culver City Historical, Julie, uh, a lot of us, we, we really saved and landmarked the main building, the, the uh, George Washington's Mount Vernon building. And uh, I, had, I had given the uh, society here the jo picture of George Washington that was owned by Harry Culver, uh, in which hung in Harry Culver's office. That's what he named Washington Boulevard after, of course. And that, that picture uh, was in the lobby of this, uh, in, in studio as a present to Ince when he, when he moved in in late 1918. But anyway, again, all of this had to do with the Pacific Line running on Culver Boulevard so they would utilize this for many, many um, purposes. And I'll go, that's Innsfield. Remember I told you where the Bison Company went? All the way there. Now the railroad did not go there. It went to Santa Monica, of course. And then they would unload people and then stagecoach them up into Santa Inez Canyon, which is where Gladstones is. Now they started to use the railroads as stars as well. This is Buck Jones. And he's on a Southern Pacific 460 10-wheeler steam locomotive number 2246, which these were all built at the turn of the century at that time. And he's appearing in the Fast Mail, starring Buck Jones for Fox in 1922. 
All the studios rented trains for use on Southern Pacific locations, which were included, which included train stations and locations. But you have to understand again, the train was a fascination to people. So look how he is co-starring with number 2246. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. Now here, down by USC, we have here Laurel and Hardy in a specially made car that collapses at the Hellroad studio by the same people that made the locomotive for our gang, of course. But look at this. They, they advise it in such a way in which the, these two uh, trolleys are like squeezing their car in between. Very funny scene. And it's right next to USC. USC is right over there, right on the other side. Hey, Mark. Yes. Ten minutes. Ten minutes. Good. Perfect. Thank you. Now, they also use uh, as stars the Silver Streak. This was a famous train that was developed in the mid-30s to be streamlined, super speed trains. They actually had it running, and the movie companies actually named the film after it and used it as a star in the film. <laughs> now, this is an old locomotive from the 19th century. Uh, it was trucked over to Lasky Mesa, which is the uh, Calabasas area, to be used in the, in the famous film, The Duel in the Sun. And that's Harry Carey again in the middle right there. But look at this beauty. Ah, oh, it's a beautiful one. Now, at the Hell Road studio and other studios, what they did was they purchased uh, actual uh, rail cars and locomotives and cut them up and used them as set pieces. So here we are at the Hell Road studio, and they actually have here a Penn, uh, Pennsylvania uh, you know, uh, rail cars. These are sleeper cars. They actually have the plans, which I have, showing that that was uh, given to the studio so they could rebuild the interiors, exactly. So listen, look at this. Look at that. Wow. You would never know. I actually have the blueprints of this. Where did I get it? From the research library at one of the studios somewhere. Now this is at Paramount on the back lot. This is for Whispering Smith in 1948. But look what they brought in. They had to truck them in. These two locomotives here, the number 18 and the 22, these are at uh, Jamestown, which is up north, which is uh, you know, in the gold country. There's the rail town, which you must visit someday. It is an original rail town where all the old trains are. They're all working, and that's where Hollywood was when they weren't here. So when they made westerns or anything, they needed railroads, they went to Jamestown. So it's, they, we still call it Jamestown is Hollywood away from Hollywood. I was just there. And Last month. Now look at that. This is my favorite picture. Now look closely. There's a film crew right there. I, it doesn't look like they're tied down because it looks like the guy is holding the tripod right there. <laughs> Isn't that incredible? Isn't that dramatic? That's what it's all about. The, this, the, the railroad, the, the, tr the uh, locomotive is a star. And that is a star. <laughs> ah, love it. Uh, Buster Keaton rebuilt the old rocket. The old rocket is the very first train ever built. It was built in England and then in the United States. And uh, he made it for his film, uh, um, uh, Our Hospitality, in 1923. And they trucked it up to a Truckee. Trucked it up to Truckee, I like that. <laughs> and they shot it up in Truckee using this old replica of one of the earliest trains. Now, for the film, um, which one was it? It was The Iron Horse in 1924. Sid Grauman, our great showman, got the idea. Why don't I borrow from, from the uh, Leland Stanford collection, the first locomotive that was at the uh, meeting of the rails in 1869 at Promontory Point. Tr uh, truck it down. No, they, they didn't truck it, excuse me. They put it on a railroad, and they took it down to Sherman, West Hollywood Station there. And they put it on the, the uh, it was small, it was, it was a, um, the tracks fit the uh, Pacific Electric. And would you believe they, they ran this to the Egyptian theater and then they craned it and put it into the forecourt. And then they put real Sioux Indians who appeared in the film posing with it. Now if that isn't publicity, I don't know what is. <laughs> and this is where they shot the meeting of the rails. This is DeMille, 1939, uh, for uh, Union Pacific. And this is supposed to be the Golden Spike Ceremony in 1869. And guess where this was shot? Are you ready? Canoga Park. <laughs> Isn't that nice? 
And this is, of course, uh, the Archeo Ranch. Archeo Ranch, which is Louise, Burbank Boulevard, and Encino. They had their own ranch, two train stations, and the railroad went, you know, from, uh, the, it forked up in the valley. One went up to Roscoe, remember I told you for the Squaw Man? And the other one through Santa Susana Pass, right into the Simi Valley and up north. So get this, so there was a spur off the uh, one that went to, Sa to, San to the Santa Susana Pass, <laughs> and into the Archeo Ranch and right into the train station. Oh, now, oh. special effects. Remember I told you about the cutouts? <laughs> they, did, they did rear projection. They didn't have fancy stuff as we have today. They have rear projection, they have the cutouts, and that is Harpo Marx actually as the coupler of the car. <laughs> and these are pieces of the cars. That's Harpo Marx standing there, it's for Go West. Their film Go West in 1940. There he is standing next to it. Look at that. There's the, uh, you know, there's the, uh, the locomotive where the engineer is and all that's just cut out and with a rear projection screen in the back. That's how they did a lot of this stuff. Now this is a picture that is a killer. This is on location near Occidental College and they're using real trolley and that's Richard Dix in there. He's supposed to be the driver here. There we go. And look at them in here, and guess what? Guess what I found? Ready? The other point of view. <laughs> that is a million to one chance I would have found this. Incredible, isn't it? Of course, Harold Lloyd doing one of the most funniest, you have to see it, hot water. He ca it's, it's Thanksgiving. His wife wants him to get a turkey and go shopping. He can't find, everybody bought all the turkeys already. So some guy says, there's a live turkey over here. Take that home. <laughs> so he takes it home with a little ribbon on it, right? And he tries to get on the trolley. The trolley is packed. It is the funniest thing you ever saw. He actually gets on somehow. And the turkey's pecking at people. It is the funniest thing you ever saw. So try to see hot water. And that was right on Hollywood Boulevard, by the way. They shot that. Now, on the back lots, they used to own, they bought old 19th century trolleys and trains, stuck them on the back lot, would use them. Now, this is at Universal in 1927. These are, that's uh, Sidney Alcott, the director on the left here with his, li with his little hat on. But the point is this, this was parked on the back of the Universal back lot. They're just pretending to be in it. But they had them there until they used, needed them. They would fix them up, bang, they're in a film. Same thing here at Paramount with uh, Mae West. They actually had a real, uh, you know, horse-drawn uh, trolley car. Not trolley, street car, excuse me. 1933, there's Mae talking to the guy. There was a whole publicity uh, campaign about this, this trolley being from the 19th century from New York and how the studio acquired it and kept it in its collection. Now for the film, who's, who's a, uh, who, um, whatever, what is it called again? Who framed Roger Rabbit? Right. I actually worked on this, I took this picture. But basically, uh, what we did was, I worked with art departments, I worked on films for many years doing this work. We actually glued, with epoxy glue, the, the track here on the, on the ground, on Coenga, right across from the Red Studio, which used to be called Ren Mar, you might remember that. And we actually had this, this built trolley car that would be in the film. And back out here to MGM, Culver City, I wanted to show you the spur. And the spur com comes right, oh boy. Here's the train station on the bottom. Come on, work. Oh, it's not working. Okay, on the bottom is the train station. You can see the train. <laughs> right there. All right, let's move on. Now back lots and ranches, as we were discussing, that's the Santa Susana Pass, Chatsworth. Look at dramatic scenes were shot there all the time. This is a real thoroughfare that went through the, that tunnel. Remember we saw Abbott and Costello running out of that tunnel? That goes right into that tunnel. On the back lot of Universal, again, using an old uh, trolley car from the 19th century. I mean, street car, excuse me. That's John Ford right there in the front, directing an early 1920 uh, film. This is at Paramount Ranch. Yes, at uh, one time this was San Francisco set at Paramount Ranch. Wow. Yes, long gone. Wow. And now, we are, now our western town is gone. I represent Paramount Ranch as well. And, but we are gonna rebuild. We're raising the money, so don't worry. We will have films there again. This is the Archeo Ranch. Remember I told you there was a spur that came out 
from the uh, from the railroad and went right into the train stations. They had a train station on the top left. I can't. It won't, won't work. This is the, one of the train stations at the RKO Ranch. Isn't that nice? And look at the old train they rented. Now they rented them from Railtown and everything. Now I met a guy named Jim Clark up in Virginia City this uh, a month ago. And from after the war, he was the main guy that rented all the trains to the studios. So he was the broker. So he went up to, he would broker a train from Railtown, have a truck or have it brought down to LA or wherever they were going and use these trains all over Southern California and California. It, what a job, what an interesting job. So all those films you see with trains in them, they all were arranged or they went to where they were. And if they're period trains, then it's even more harder to find. And yeah, now we're getting to the end. Getting to the end now. <laughs> I know, I got you scared. Hollywood publicity. This is the most fun. Yes, this is the girls here for, for the film. Um, 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 it was um, 42nd Street, 1933. Uh, uh, and they were, they were here. It says here, Warner Brothers 42nd Street dancers posed for publicity photos at the Santa Fe Redondo Junction Yard in Los Angeles, celebrating the premiere of the film on Fri February 4, 1933. A train called the 42nd Street Special traveled from Hollywood to New York City, arriving in time for the opening of the Strand Theater on March 8, 1933. On the train were the Warner Brothers contract players. <laughs> Don't look at them dancing there. Now, of course, they're advertising. Look at Gloria Swanson advertising three for Bedroom C, the color motion picture filmed on the Santa Fe Super Chief, showing at the Astra Theater. And over here is Union Pacific. On the left, it's, uh, it's Barbara Stanwyck in Cesar B. In Cesar B. DeMille's Union Pacific shows, her, shows off with the other cast on the front of the locomotive, right? Now, this is the biggest publicity. Remember, Union Station opened in 1939, right? So Cecil B. DeMille got a great idea. Why don't I premiere my film, Union Pacific, when the opening of the Union Pacific Station? They did. So what they did was they had a giant parade down Alameda Street using the trains used in the film. Here is DeMille with the mayor of the city and uh, some of the actors, and, and it's just, wow. What can I say? It was a wow event. And they had a, a sampling of each locomotive from each uh, uh, era, you know, from the 19th century, 20th century. Now, uh, near, this near the end, this is, this is when the movie stars are going somewhere. So they had the studios had publicity photographers there. Why? That Tom Mix and his wife and kid are going on the Southern Pacific to Chicago. You see what I mean? It advertises the train and the star and the film and the studio, all in one. Look at this one. This is uh, Joan Crawford getting off at La Grande Station in downtown in 1938. And um, let's see, when the press met the stars at the station, their arrivals or departures would mention they were taking the super chief. That was their preference. And at the end of the train, they used the end. This is called a drum sign. They used to put uh, advertising on them. Uh, this is where presidents spoke or other politicians spoke from the back of the train. They used them in the films. This is a MGM star, Viola Dana, poses with, uh, while leaning on the drum head for the publicity cameras as she departs Los Angeles in 1924, excuse me, on the Southern Pacific Golden State train to promote her latest film, Along Came Ruth. This is for a film called in 1920, let's see, this is 1928. That's a Bob Steele Western. That's one of the B Western guys. And they're on location in Santa Susana Pass again on the way to Simi Valley. Yes, Charlie Chaplin, like everybody. The minute Chaplin is there, bang. It was both coasts. The world knows Chaplin is going to New York. And how is he going? On the Los Angeles Limited. And look at this, they stuffed cameras, lights, everything on the back here to shoot one little scene of them talking. 1931, look at what they, what they went through. Jeez, compared to the cameras of today. <laughs> and this is the Squaw Man. Remember I told you in Sun Valley, they rented a gravel train. Remember in, in, um, 
in that area of Sun Valley is actually a gravel town. That's where the river comes through, leaves all the gravel for 10,000s of years. They've been digging it up. They're still digging there to this day. Well, they rented the gravel trains, and that's what they use in the film, The Squaw Man. And the last ones, just to show you a few more of the publicity of the beautiful posters. Look at the Iron Horse poster. This is a rainbow. And the railroad is going over the rainbow, meaning, <laughs> right? Meaning coming from the east to the west, to the rainbow, the land. Oh my God. <laughs> The Roar of the Iron Horse, Rock Island Trail, Cimarron Kid, Whispering Smith. By the way, Whispering Smith is actually not a name. It's, it's a name of a agent. It's the name of a railroad agent or detective. That's what they call them, Whispering Smiths. I didn't know that until I did this research. And that is end of the slideshow. Thank you.